this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into covering the spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and numberfire.com, where we are getting set for week number two in the NFL and discussing any big takeaways we saw from week number one with Edward Egros of TVG's More Ways to Win. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com, joined here as always by Ed Feng. You can find his work over at thepowerrank.com. Ed, we got a week of the NFL in the books, but we also now have Big Ten football coming up at the end of October. How you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, I think it's an interesting decision by the Big Ten to come back. I'm hopeful that they can get it done. Uh, I think it's exciting for all the fans, and me as a fan definitely is is excited about it. But it, it's it's a really interesting situation when you look at, uh, you know, how many games have been postponed already during the college football season. You know, only 50 teams have played, um, and there's been a lot of postponements. So, you know, the COVID is on these campuses um, if the COVID is on the University of Michigan's campus, it's going to spread because I keep seeing uh, a lot of pickup basketball games yeah. <laughs> around campus. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I will say that uh, I'm, I'm in Syracuse, so I'm by a college campus, too. And this could be because New York's laws are fairly strict about masks, but they've been doing a decent job. They got a fairly scathing letter from the university president about parties and stuff like that. But, like... When you drive around, like, they're doing a pretty good job of being masked up. So kudos to them. You know, kids taking things seriously. You yeah. like to see that. And I agree that I'm skeptical about the Big Ten. The one thing that I think is good is the testing plan where they'll be testing not just football athletes, but all athletes uh, every day, it sounds like, and, and doing that. I think that's a positive. So the Big Ten, from a communication perspective, really bungled things like, a lack of transparency made things a lot more of a headache for themselves than he needed to. However, like, I don't think they did things necessarily wrong. Like, postponing until you had better testing, that's the way things should go. So, criticize the Big Ten for a lack of communication. I don't think we should criticize them for waiting for better testing, because better testing, this is something you've talked about in, like, March, like how the importance of testing if we want to get back to normal and they waited until we got better testing and, and reacted to that. So criticize the communication. I don't think the execution is as big of an error there. Sure. I mean, the only thing, I mean, the problem that I see is like, you know, I mean, there's, there's a decent chance that a conference like the big 12 stops before the, the big 10 starts. <laughs> <True>. Right. <laughs> so I don't know if you heard, but Lincoln Riley said Oklahoma was really lucky to play. They're not yeah. releasing any numbers about COVID cases, but he did say that uh, they were lucky to play. And someone asked him if they had three positive tests, and he kind of laughed at that as a number <laughs> too small. You know, and that was a game that actually happened, right? Yeah. This is not yeah. like a BYU game that got canceled. This is not like the TCU that got canceled and, you know, a number of other ones. Um, so... You know, the ACC has said they're going to march on as long as they have eight out of 15 teams. <laughs> so, like, a simple majority <laughs> works in that situation. Um, so It was also kind of jarring to have this Big Ten announcement come the day after Ed Orgeron talked about how most of the LSU players had had it, which is like... Yep. It's like uh, there was like this this meme on Twitter of like weird flex, but OK, like that was the most weird flex, but OK type thing. Like, I know he wasn't trying to like brag, but it came off like it came off so wild that like well, you... we're kind of speaking nonchalantly about a literal pandemic. And that was like the, the juxtaposition of that with Big Ten coming back was it, it caught my attention, I'll say. I mean, you, you've heard of herd immunity. They, yeah. they tried it out at LSU, right? So Apparently. Or so. are trying it out. I, I don't remember what the most recent numbers were. I remember there was 30 They're not releasing cases. public numbers. Yeah, so that doesn't really help either, right? Right, right. So you, we can't even fact check and be like, oh, like when he says most, what does that mean? We can't check it. So, uh, I, I mean, the Big Ten is going to be publishing numbers, it seems like, or they have thresholds to where uh, sure. games get postponed. I'm happy about that, but like... We'll see. Um, I'm hopeful, but not, yeah. you know, it's not it's not a, a sure thing by any well, means just yet. And then you also think about a timeline of nine conference games right. in nine weeks. There's no wiggle room. 
there's no wiggle room because I understand you want to be in the college football playoff and, and you have a team in Ohio State that projects to be there. And, and I get that. But I mean, and I'm sure they figured out the contingencies of when, you know, inevitable cancellations do happen. Right. But I don't know. And then it's also just, you know, all my algorithms are so screwed with the SEC and the Big Ten, <laughs> like only playing conference games. It's like I have to run right. the numbers separate for those conferences right. in order to, uh, you know, to, to add some of that data. So that annoys me as well. Bowl season is going to be fun for you, assuming First, it comes. No, bowl season is going to stink. I need. Oh, to no, that's what I was being very, very, very aggressively sarcastic for you. <laughs> no, because like that, that's what I do. I right. account for strength of schedule, and those three out-of-conference games mean a lot. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, good luck. So, uh, <laughs> but, but it, it'll, you know, it's going to force me to look at, like, how these conference ratings bounce around from season to season. Sure. And if it's a point or two, eh, so be it. Yeah. You know? Because then I'll just go with the the preseason averages and have a wiggle room of a point or two. Well, we shall see. Big Ten football just around the corner, we think, and we'll see how that goes. Coming up in just a bit, our guest for today is Edward Egros. You can find him on Twitter at EdWithSports. You can also find him on TVG's More Ways to Win every week. He is an adjunct professor at SMU, so we'll talk about uh, what things are like on a college campus from a, a teaching perspective as he is doing that. And we're also going to preview week number two in the NFL, discuss any big takeaways Edward had from week number one, and get you set for Edward's favorite bets in week number two. Do not forget to subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We are here weekly as always. Maybe we'll have to get some college football podcasts back on, assuming college football sold is on, so we'll see about that down the road. But make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. Before we get to Edward, we got to go back to last week. We had JJ Zacharyson on to talk about week number one. We'll go back through that and then dive into week two. Covering the past. So last week here on Covering the Spread, we had J.J. Zacharyson on. You can find him on Twitter at Late Round QB. He is the editor-in-chief of Number Fire and FanDuel. He talked about that Thursday night game between the Chiefs and the Texans and a, a tough pee for J.J. because he wanted the over on 54.5 points. And tough way to lose here because the game was at 51 points. The Chiefs were on the goal line, and they got stuffed. They could have gone for a touchdown to go up three scores, but there were just 30 seconds left, so you're not expecting the Texans to overcome it uh, to score deficit in that time. So they did kick the field goal, finished at exactly 54 points. The bookmakers nailed that one. Uh, tough way to open the year there. JJ got good closing line value in the Bucks saints game. He wanted the under on 49.5, and, and he wanted the Saints minus 3.5. The total did drop to 48 at close, and the Saints were four-point favorites. So good value in both directions. And J.J. did nail the spread. The Saints obviously won that game. Uh, the game did go over the total, thanks in part to a pick six there. J.J. had the over on Cardinals 49ers at 48.5. That one finished at 44, so under did hit there. And then he leaned, uh, or he had the over on Cowboys-Rams at 51 and a half. Cowboys had injuries on the offensive line in game, so that one did finish at 37. JJ was right overall in offense being the lean for the week. He just happened to pick three of the games that that, that did go under. So uh, good overall thought process, just some bad luck on JJ's part there. I also had a bit of a mixed bag last week. The first bet I mentioned was Panthers Raiders over 46 and a half. That one closed at 48, so it did go up at a point and a half. That one went over the total pretty easily. 64 total points there, so a win. Uh, the other, though, was Seahawks-Falcons. I doubted that the Seahawks would unleash their very talented quarterback, and they proved me wrong. Uh, Seahawks let Russ cook, and it blew up. 63 total points, so one for one, or one for two on my end to open the season. But, Ed, a crazy week of football where we did see, like JJ predicted, a lot of points scored pretty much across the board. Yeah, for sure, and uh, we'll we'll probably continue to see that a little bit until the defenses get some reps under them, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that uh, levels out. Yeah, I believe, I saw a stat today, I'm pretty sure it was the most touchdowns in one week in NFL history, so 
things huh. clearly were cooking. Uh, that's for sure. But um, we'll see how things play out in week number two. We'll preview that in just one second. But first, FanDuel is always giving users a chance at glory in a big payday. And the Ringers Mega Contest is the latest way they are giving you more ways to win. It's easy. Just make five picks against the spread, including one double down every week. The top 100 users at the end of the season will compete for $25,000 in prizes during the playoffs. And the best part? It is free to enter. Week one is already in the books, so what are you waiting for to enter for free? Visit playfree.fanduel.com slash the ringer. That is playfree dot fanduel.com slash the ringer if you go to fanduel there is also a banner in the lobby that's probably easier than the the url but it is play free dot fanduel.com slash the ringer eligibility restrictions apply let's bring in edward egros now again find him on twitter at ed with sports you can find him on tvg's more ways to win and check him uh professing over at smu we're going to preview week number two and take a look back at the big takeaways from week one covering the present Let's bring Edward Egros back into covering the spread. It's been a while, Edward. How you doing? I know it's been it's been months at this point. It, it, it has been months, and that's about how long it took to grow the beard. So if there's <laughs> any indicator as to, to how long it's been since we have uh, convened, there you go. So if you ever needed an incentive to check out covering the spread on the FanDuel YouTube page, Edward has given it to you uh, via his beard, which you can see live and in person over on the FanDuel YouTube page. Uh, But also, Edward, it's nice to have you on here because we have not talked to a college professor since we started doing, you know, these podcasts after the the COVID-19 pandemic began. What have things been like for you at SMU with all the, the calamity going on? Well, it has been interesting, to say the least. I think one of the the challenges that uh, SMU has faced and a lot of colleges have faced is basically there is major economic incentive having students on campus, no doubt about it. And that's I I think that's fair to say, no matter who you're working for. I think my my observation has been that, you know, some classes have, have basically been adjusted to where Half the class is in person, half the class is remote, and then you go vice versa. And there have been some real technological issues. Uh, I have no problem admitting that uh, in terms of trying to get everyone on the same page, keeping discussions dynamic, those kinds of things. And so put, put the danger of the virus to one side and just think about the logistics involved within having some students take things remotely and then their lives are sort of upside down whenever a roommate uh, has a positive test, then they have to quarantine for 14 days, or they know of a situation where a friend of theirs or a family member of theirs gets the virus, and they may not be in, in great shape. And it's one of those things where it, it, it constantly feels like my head is on a swivel when it comes to just trying to keep track of what everybody is trying to do and make sure that assignments are turned in on, turned in on time. And that if you're explaining something that maybe you have to repeat yourself a couple of times because Everyone is dealing with a lot of distractions around them, no doubt about it. And there are things that they can't control. And so, you know, psychologically, it's been quite the challenge. Uh, But at the same time, it's also uh, great to have that attempt at normalcy, which has been tough in a lot of ways. And so uh, in, in many respects, I think SMU has done a great job in terms of trying to transition back to normal. But they've been enduring the same challenges that that most every college has. And it's not going to be perfect, uh, no, no doubt about that. And at least uh, we, we have opportunities to uh, sit down with the students. And if someone really needs to talk, that you, know, you know, make, or make yourself available and sort of figure this stuff out together, as it were. For sure. And the other advantage of having you on here, Edward, is that you were on a college campus, which means that we had the big news with the Big Ten today uh, coming back October 23rd and 24th. Based on what you've seen at SMU, and obviously the testing the Big Ten's promising to do does change things for sure, but are you optimistic we can actually make this thing work given what you've seen being on a college campus? Honestly, I'm probably more pessimistic than anything else. I think, first off, if you just look at the number of games that have had to be canceled or postponed in just this month alone, we just started college football a couple of weeks ago, and we've had several attempts that have gone awry. Uh, You know, SMU, for instance, uh, they were to play TCU, battle the Iron Skillet uh, just last weekend. That game got canceled because there's been an outbreak of COVID uh, on the TCU campus. And yes, they're trying to make sure that they're prepared for Big Big 12 play. And so we all have priorities. I get that. 
Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't take much for a school to deal with some serious problems. And then that affects the opponent. And then what happens in terms of an overall resume? There are teams in the Big Ten that are fighting for a playoff spot, fighting for a conference championship. Uh, is the resume going to be too small for them to have a legitimate chance? Now, one thing I will say that I think is great that the Big Ten is doing is that they're not allowing fans at games. Uh, they pretty much said from the get-go, no place, no school will have fans. And I think that is great when it comes to limiting uh, those worst case scenarios. I wish other conferences would have said that uh, from the beginning, but at least the Big Ten is in some ways going about it the right way in terms of acquiring information. Uh, the thing about heart conditions and COVID, I think they did some more research into that and looks like they did their due diligence, which is great to see. I have my doubts. I wish that things could be postponed a little bit in terms of the playoff committee, championships, things like that. But... There are some things the Big Ten is doing very, very well in terms of due diligence, not having fans, those kinds of things. But at the same time, I'm still just pessimistic in general because we've seen a lot of you know, games postponed, canceled, things like that, that that make me concerned. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's uh, it's still touch and go, to say the least. Uh, testing begins in the Big Ten at the end of September, so... We will see how things go then. But let's dive into the NFL now, Edward. The reason we have you here for today, because we finally got some data. Well, we have one yeah, week I... of play in the books. You get to play with things once again. It's great. Yeah. Uh, in these new environments with either no fans or very few fans, looking at the league as a whole here, Edward, are there any big league-wide takeaways you had from what you saw in week number one? First off, I would like to have uh, yours and Ed's permission to talk nerdy. To begin do with. it please absolutely okay. talk nerdy to me let's do all it all right we need to update our win probability models that's what we <laughs> need to do. that's that's the biggest takeaway that i got from week one and i'm really serious about it because i i'm very much a disciple of uh, a piece of work that came out at sloan several years ago from brian skinner where he talked about the underdog theory and basically it's about if you are trailing in a sporting event football basketball whatever you have to take on more risk to catch up, especially if you are an underdog going into it. So what does this mean in terms of football? Passing a good bit more, no huddle, up-tempo, higher average depth of target perhaps. And what I worry in terms of building our win probability models is that we just assume that everybody is going to play the same way from beginning to end. And coaches are getting smarter. Coordinators and play callers are getting a lot smarter when it comes to realizing that that's just not going to work. You will have to take on more risk if you are trailing and perhaps if you are even an underdog and you're trying to win a football game. Let's take the Bears-Lions game, for instance. I looked up a couple of win probability models. Uh, we're about five minutes to go. Lions were up 10, third and 17 for them. I believe they were in Chicago territory at that point. And a couple of models that I saw said – 97 to 98% of the time, the Lions are going to win this football game. And they didn't. And this was one of a couple of games where an underdog stormed back and stormed back and won in just the early slate alone. And I thought to myself, you know what, 97 to 98%, that's not intuitive. That doesn't sound right to me. And as, as someone who embraces the data, loves modeling, all that stuff, as you guys know, Still, though, th there has to be a little bit of intuition involved in terms of looking at results and going, OK, does this make sense? Does this pass the laugh test? And I think a lot of win probability models have not done that. If the three of us put our heads together, we can come up with at least 20 games out of a thousand where a dog won in similar situations like the Bears ultimately did. Uh, Detroit secondary decimated with hamstring injuries. Um, you know, all these things are important, not just in terms of updating win probability models, but especially if you're going to do in-game betting. To me, that's huge because no team, in essence, is out of it. Unless you're dealing with the 31st or 32nd best offense in football, no team is out of it. And those are opportunities in, in terms of in-game betting to find major dogs and believe, hey, an injury here, uh, an interception there, all of a sudden they're back into it. Look at look at even offenses that that aren't maybe so so hot right now, like the Eagles, for instance. They play a lot of twelve personnel, and twelve personnel is you know a little bit revolutionary. It's sort of that next step, as it were, that a lot of offenses are embracing. And in large part, it it maybe hasn't transpired in terms of uh, you know EPA per dropback, but 
they, they, they've won games. They didn't win week one, but they won the division last year. So to me, if we start believing that no lead is safe, I think we'll have a, a better idea as far as how football is actually supposed to function in late game situations. Yeah, I mean, I think the part of that that's most interesting is is potentially the play calling, right? Like, if, if you're throwing it deeper when you're down, um, that's something that can mess with those models. I don't know. I mean, I think intuitively, I think those things are, like, I mean, you can obviously make tweaks to do it better, but, like, they got to be within a couple percentage points. I don't know what, what the Chicago game was, uh, what the score was, or what the time was when it said 98%. And obviously, I'm, I'm almost certain the model is not going to consider any type of defensive back injuries that happen during the game. Of course. No, no you're absolutely right. Um, but I think also, too, if you're dealing with like normal distribution, sometimes the tails are where things get wonky. And I, sure. I think that's probably my point is that, yeah, you're, you're mean, as it were, is probably fine. But when you're dealing with those extremes, when you're talking 97, 98 percent, it, it, it should be at almost absolute certainty, and it feels like we're getting more and more situations where that's not the case. Obviously, there are extenuating factors when it comes to win probability models, but still, it, there, there may be adjustments that can be made to where the tails are a little bit more accurate. Yeah, yeah. for sure. You know, we've had Ed Miller on the show. He, he has some models that, uh, that are part of his company. Uh, it'd be interesting to ask him about that. Yeah, Very absolutely. Well. I just looked at uh, number fires model. We had a 97% too. So <laughs> maybe we'll have to get Edward over here to, to check those out as well. Uh, let's talk about a, a specific I'll just be nagging. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let's talk about things on a team level basis, because we have the league wide data, as you alluded to with play calling changes, but we can also get the, get numbers from individual teams, but also some numbers can be deceptive in such a small sample. So Edward, are there any stickier numbers from from one game you can look at to alter your the way you view various teams? Well, in general, I really am not paying much attention to defensive numbers, and typically I don't anyway because they're not that sticky from from one season to the next, and perhaps not even one game to the next. Sometimes, you know, you look at you know Von Miller, for instance, uh, if he were playing, then obviously he's a phenomenal linebacker, and you know, not taking anything away from him. It's just defenses. Uh, it's tougher to, to be successful from, from one game to the next. And I especially think given what we saw in week one and how things were unfolding in terms of the offseason with the pandemic, um, I think it was uh, J.J. Uh, Zacharyson who you know was very adamant saying, no, this is going to favor offenses in week one. And he turned out to be right. And especially when it comes to the gambling market, uh, we saw many more overs than we did unders, and I think that's in large part because those offenses with continuity, same quarterback, pretty much the same offensive line, pretty much the same weapons, we saw good things for them, like the Saints with, with Drew Brees. And even though he didn't have Michael Thomas for part of that time, uh, Drew Brees was still very much effective. Uh, Alvin Kamara was still effective. So w when I look at that, I go, okay, the Saints should be just fine. Uh, it doesn't matter that they didn't have a preseason to get things going. But on the other side, with Tampa Bay, Tom Brady will need some time. Um, it, it did seem, at least at a couple of situations, that maybe he and the receivers were not on the same page, and maybe a uh, preseason would have helped as far as that's concerned. Um, it also certainly seemed like maybe we shouldn't be so hard on Jameis Winston in terms of why he had so many <laughs> interceptions. Maybe the system, maybe the receivers not being on the same page with Winston, maybe that has something to do with it. But that being said, when it comes to my own modeling and picks that I'm making, if an offense has some continuity, then I have no qualms at all bringing in 2019, maybe even 2018 numbers in terms of figuring out where the numbers should exist. But if you're dealing with something that's brand new, definitely I'd say give it a week or two before you start to, to really hone in on their EPA numbers, for instance, and then proceeding. Sounds good. Let's dive into some games. Uh, first one, we got Rams at Eagles. Uh, Rams are uh, one and a half point favorites, total at 46 and a half. Uh, you know, Eagles struggled week one um, against, uh, you know, what my model has one of, as one of the, against a team that my model has one of the, as one of the two worst teams in the NFL. Um, Rams obviously did pretty well against Dallas on Sunday night. What are you thinking about this game? Well, first off, I know, Ed, that the family conversations that you have uh, late in the evenings involve play-action passing. 
Uh, I, I know <laughs> you course. get the, the whole family together, maybe even a, a camera to, to yeah, record it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah record it, put it on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, it, like it's it, it's how you live your life, and and I applaud that. But the the thing is, play action passing is important, and it doesn't matter how effective the running game is. Play action passing in a vacuum is what is important in, in all of this, and. Especially when, when you look at Eagles and Rams, both teams, both offenses certainly understand that. In fact, last year, uh, Goff and Wentz were first and second, respectively, in play-action pass attempts. This year, small sample size, obviously, but Goff is fifth and Wentz is ninth. And I think that eventually that will go back up a little bit. Now, maybe some offenses uh, have figured out the importance of play-action passing, like the Bills, for instance, and Josh Allen. So it's certainly possible that they may not get to one and two this year, but I think they are going to, to stay in the top eight. I think that's safe to say. So I think ultimately they're going to get theirs in certain situations. But here's the interesting thing, though. L.A. started to use more 12 personnel beginning in week 11, and their EPA per play ranked 16th during that time frame, which is average, half the team better, half the team worse. And last week they pretty much stayed right there against that Cowboys defense. Eagles, however, over these last several games, they've been dead last. And there are enough injuries with Philly and enough guys who are certainly not 100% but are, but are at least playing to where I feel like the movement within the line is exactly how it should be behaving. Yeah, uh, it, w- it opened at minus 2.5. Uh, the Eagles are 2.5-point favorites. Now the Rams are favored by 1.5. I think that's very interesting, given that Lane Johnson sounds like he thinks he's going to play. Uh, but with the play-action numbers, are you thinking an over on this game, or do you have any reads on either the spread or the total here? I, I do think the over is is fair game here. What's what's interesting to me is that it, it with with a couple of models that I've seen that it, it looks like a Rams runaway, but it is a West Coast team traveling to the East for a 1 p.m. kickoff, so. Right away, I'm going to take it with a grain of salt. But, you know, even though you know, some, I think one model I even had uh, said that the Rams might win by a couple of touchdowns, which seems a little insane <laughs> to me. Uh, but it could happen. I mean, yeah. you know, we have the range seen of the Rams go off, so it, it's, not with, it, it's within the realm of possibilities. But I do think, given that it's one and a half, I don't have a problem buying it to two and a half, uh, sort of keeping out a magic number and keeping it simple. Uh, I don't have an issue with that. One thing, though, that I think is important here is that, and and I was a bit surprised to see this, that the Cowboys last week ran the fastest offensive pace in all of football. And now the Rams are going to face an Eagles offense that will slow it down a good bit more. They're more middle of the road. And so that could very much limit things by a drive or two as far as, uh, you know, L.A. scoring is concerned. So, I think the over is still very much in play, but I don't think it's going to be anything ridiculous. And I think, uh, you know, a field goal win for the Rams would be about right. All righty, let's move on here to the Ravens at the Texans. Deshaun Watson versus Lamar Jackson didn't quite live up to the billing last year, but we get it once again this year, this time over in Houston. Ravens seven-point favorites. Total here is up to 52 now. The Texans offense seemed to struggle in week one with no DeAndre Hopkins. Was there anything you saw there that made you readjust your priors on this Houston team in a very new context with one of their the best receivers in football now gone? You know, I don't want to sound like a Houston apologist here, but I actually think the Texans are going about a lot of this the right way. Uh, when you look at EPA CPOE composite, Deshaun Watson was 14th after week one against a good secondary in Kansas City. I don't think they struggled very much. I think David Johnson was was fairly dynamic in terms of what he was able to do. I think that this offense, you know, even against a, a phenomenal team in Kansas City, they still were about above average. I think part of the issue that I think we're going to see, and yes, I, I know the NFL sort of embraces uh, parodies, so to speak, but to me, this is Kansas City and this is Baltimore and everyone else is just living in that world right now. And I think that's why you're going to see some teams like Houston, for instance, start out 0-2, and yet they have some pretty decent offenses. I think one of the things that I I look at in terms of that offseason move, uh, trading away DeAndre Hopkins, he was going to be expensive. So that was going to be an issue in terms of payroll. You know, David Johnson, I know running back, we all agree about, you know, how we feel about running backs. That's fine. But I also believe that in terms of if you're building a passing attack, I actually think it's better to have a lot of 1B options 
instead of a 1A and a lot of two or three options. And I think that's what Houston is trying to pull off. I think if they get to if they get the ball to guys like Brandon Cooks and Randall Cobb a little bit more frequently and make it a situation where it's not always going to Will Fuller because, you know, there are injury concerns there. But if they are able to diversify the portfolio, so to speak, I actually think Houston can be a pretty decent team. Yeah, I think yeah. that that's that's possible. Ed talked about liking Houston overall last week, and it, it's you kind of have to take these lumps. Like this is the schedule they were given. This is going to happen. But long term, I agree. Like you know, uh, I mean, basically they had to make a choice: do you pay DeAndre Hopkins or do you pay Laramie Tunsil? I might pay Laramie Tunsil personally, yeah. but uh, you know that might be egregious. But I just I think Tunsil's very good. So Ravens blast the Browns in Week One. Uh, they're seven point road favorites. Are you laying the seven points here, or what's your read on this game? Am I talking out of both sides of my mouth by saying such good things about <laughs> Houston, but then also saying that the Ravens no. will definitely the Ravens cover are good. This. You're fine. <laughs> yes. It, like I said, you have you have Chiefs, Ravens, one two, however you want to look at it. And then everybody else. And the drop-off to me is a, a rather substantial. I think the Saints could very well jump back into things. By the way, I was going to say, too, that after Houston loses, that is a great time yeah. to go to sportsbook.fanduel.com and <laughs> basically say, hey, Houston can still win the AFC South. Uh, that's right. probably going to be your value bet as far as that's concerned. I do love the Titans, but wait till they lose this game. And the, you know, the math nerds will say, how do you come back from 0-2? You know, Houston could do it. The AFC South is, is tricky. But as far as this game is concerned, yeah, Lamar Jackson's unbelievable. I mean, he, he's playing at an MVP caliber level again. And what's fascinating to me, he, had the, he felt the third highest pressure rate of any quarterback last week at 31%, still went 9 of 10 on throws of 10-plus yards, and then he finished with the most completed air yards per completion at 10.1 yards. And I look at this and I go, why are we not embracing Lamar Jackson more as a passer? This guy in man coverage has been unbelievable. And his issue is that, you know, Hollywood Brown has not been on the field very much. There maybe isn't too many reliable targets beyond Mark Andrews, but can Lamar Jackson sling it? Absolutely he can. He is an incredibly dynamic quarterback, and we need to embrace him as one of the great stars in the National Football League. So I look at this and I go, yeah, the Ravens can definitely cover seven. If this line moves too much, though, then I might flip to Houston. I think I've got it at eight right now in terms of uh, where I feel comfortable. If it gets to eight and a half, then I'm going the other way. But at seven, I feel great about Baltimore. Yeah, no, my numbers have Ravens by uh, about seven and a half. Uh, this was, you know, they, they moved pretty big with that performance over Cleveland. And I still... I, I'm trying to figure out whether Baltimore is that good or whether we need to really change our opinion on the Cleveland Browns. Both. Let's do both. <laughs> it, it, it might be both. And we're going to get a very interesting data point on Thursday night, which I'm, I'm very much looking forward to. Um, but before, before we get to that, uh, Patriots and Seahawks, last game we wanted to ask you about. Patriots uh, minus four at home, total of 45 and a half. Uh, you know, the Seahawks let Russ cook a little bit last week. Uh, the guy's obviously talented. They ran, they, sorry, they threw more on first down in the first half, and they they pulled away. Uh, Patriots look pretty decent with Cam Newton uh, running the ball. Uh, he actually threw the ball pretty well in terms of yards per pass attempts. What are you thinking about this game? So this is a really good question as to if Seattle will continue to let Russ cook or if they go, or if they are going to try and establish the run because they are too afraid of the Patriots secondary or, or whatever it might be. Uh, Pete Carroll's stubborn. I don't know. And while I am very much afraid of succumbing to recency bias, uh, it's, it's what gives me cold sweats at night. <laughs> I think what's important here is that I – Whenever you have those anomalies in terms of a team passing a lot more than usual or running a lot more than usual, sort of my methodology is, first off, I look at the injury report to see if a lack of personnel necessarily forced game script. Going back to the Eagles, for instance, Miles Sanders didn't play in that game. They're not comfortable with the running backs they have, so they passed it a good bit more, especially in early down situations. To me, that's not their identity. That's not something that they necessarily want to do a lot, and I think Miles Sanders is, you know, someone they want in, in many dynamic situations. And so I look at it and go, yeah, for the Eagles, personnel mattered. For Seattle, their injury report is, is largely unscathed. They look fine as far as that's concerned. And so that didn't help. Then I looked at Atlanta's defense to figure out if there, were, if there was some major mismatch. 
And yeah, Atlanta's worse defending the pass than defending the run. But at the same time, it wasn't such a huge discrepancy to where it was obvious what Seattle was supposed to do in that situation. So the two big factors here that would help put some logic into this situation, I go, well, it's not there. It may actually be Russell Wilson campaigning to let himself cook more. And that campaign, hey, it's an election year. I can say these things. But that's, that's the deal is that the campaign is working and Pete Carroll is listening to his quarterback, and it's kumbaya right now. And all right, I'm succumbing to recency bias. I think I think Russ will be cooking some more on Sunday. I think it's okay to to succumb to recency bias in situations that are not dictated by variance. And I think that play calling is less dictated by variance than a lot of other things. So I actually think you're okay buying <laughs> into recency bias there, especially when there was a lot of. Uh, there was a drumbeat that they might actually do this, and they did so. So I don't think it's a bad thing uh, to buy into what you saw there. So let's talk about the other side of this game here. We got uh, Cam Newton looking good, at least as a rusher, in week number one. Do you think he can do enough to help the Patriots cover here, or do the Seahawks uh, win by four or more? I'm going to go with the Seahawks here. I I think Cam Newton uh, certainly looked good from the start, but at the same time, it was only 21 points against a, a Miami defense that – you know, has some great players, but like we said before, defense is tricky right now because of communication, not having that off season, uh, new pieces there. It it seemed to me like I would have wanted a little bit more out of maybe more of the receivers than anything else to feel comfortable as far as what the Patriots are are capable of doing. But again, with the Seahawks passing so much in early down non-garbage time situations, it, it just seemed to me like this, this is going to be, a very potent offense in the NFL and it's not going to be slowing down anytime soon. And especially if they're able to do this against a great Patriots secondary, then I go, you know what? (laughs) Then they're going to be really hard to beat. (laughs) They should be the NFC West favorites. And one thing I will say though, in terms of Cam Newton's uh, ability to run, I think he'll still be able to do that. I wouldn't be surprised if the Patriots hang 20, 24, something like that. It will chew up some clock. And so I do think this will be a closer game uh, probably around six, six and a half, something like that. So again, the line is, is pretty close to where it should be. But I, I, I believe in Russell Wilson too much. I think he can cover the four. Uh, sounds good. Uh, are there any other games on week one at FanDuel Sportsbooks that you're interested in? So I guess I am contractually <laughs> obligated to mention the Dallas Cowboys yes. uh, being here uh, in 50. <laughs> I, I I think they're they're gonna pick things up from uh, the offensive you know insanity that they were able to embrace last year, and I don't see much in terms of week one that leads me to believe that uh, they're gonna struggle uh, in week two, especially against this Atlanta defense. I I do think though, and this is actually something I, I wanted to ask you guys about. One weird thing about covering the Cowboys for for several years now is they. They are weird when it comes to home road splits. Yeah. And I don't get it because I know home runs, home road splits are largely spurious. Uh, There's really no reason for it. But there have been years when the Cowboys, I I think 2014, when they won every road game, uh, that was nuts uh, when they had uh, DeMarco Murray. Uh, But last year, they were phenomenal at home offensively. But then on the road, they they couldn't do very much. It was the same thing in 2018. Because I look at this this a lot for Daily Fantasy, and my hypothesis initially was turf. But then last year, I think it was Indianapolis. It was either last year or the year before. They went to Indy, played indoors, and this is after the Amari Cooper trade, laid a complete goose egg. And last week was also indoors. So, like, that was my hypothesis. My hypothesis sucked. I don't get it either. (laughs) No, exactly. No, I was actually at that game in Indy, and yeah. <laughs> I was I was shocked by that. It was like they finished the season winning seven of eight, looking great in just about every contest. They go to Indy and lay a goose egg, first time in a while for them, and I, I don't understand it. Amari Cooper's sort of you know lack of availability in 2019, especially in the Philly contest, it just doesn't make sense to have all this bad luck happen on the road versus at home. The split doesn't mean anything. And yet I do believe that in week two, the Cowboys will probably hang 35 to 40 on Atlanta. And, you know, I also, too, I mean, look at that Rams game from Sunday night. Had CeeDee Lamb run to the sticks, then perhaps we're talking about the Cowboys very differently. They get 24. Or if maybe Michael Gallup a- hadn't gotten called for a phantom pass interference. Or if Jalen Ramsey hadn't been a world-class actor. 
Yeah, exactly. There, there are enough isolated cases to where you go, okay, 17 was about the worst they were going to do. They're really mo- they were really more of a 24, 27 point uh, offense in that game. And especially against Atlanta at home, you know, you give another game uh, of, of CeeDee Lamb trying to redeem himself. I, I think they'll be just fine. I think it'll be a blowout win for them. All righty. Any other games you're eyeing or are we all set? I think we're all set. All right, perfect. Uh, I think that we got some good takeaways for week number two. This should be a lot of fun and uh, some more football to watch. Hopefully we have plenty to watch for the rest of the fall as well. That is Edward Egros. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at EdWithSports and check him out on More Ways to Win. Edward, I appreciate it. Good luck to you in week number two. Hopefully we'll talk to you again here soon and check out the marvelous beard once again. Aw, oh, shucks. You cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Edward Egros for coming on and previewing week number two. And Ed, I wish we had spent more time talking Dallas because obviously Edward has a lot of knowledge when it comes to the Cowboys. I sure. uh, used to host a podcast about them and things like that. And we talk a lot about overreactions to week one, but seeing Dallas as only a four and a half point favorite against an Atlanta team that is very, uh, I don't know, like nondescript. I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, <laughs> seeing that, it, it, it is very interesting to me. Yeah, well, those two teams were involved in games with uh, with a lot of late movement. Um, so the markets, you know, actually before that game happened, made a pretty decisive move against Dallas. So Dallas was the favorite heading into that Sunday night game at the Rams. Rams ended up as, a, I think, a one-point favorite in that game. So, and that was interesting to me. I thought that was the wrong direction. I mean, LA ended up winning that game. They probably deserved to win that game. Um, well, that's debatable, but, but it was a close game. <laughs> Um, but you know, the Rams are an interesting team because, uh, so I do a wisdom of crowds model where I, yeah. uh, put together the, the opinions of, of sports writers that, that cover the NFL. I found this to be very predictive over the past. And that model was very down on the Rams below NFL yeah. average. Yeah. Um, so, but the markets were very strong in saying like, yeah, we, we believe in this team. We believe Sean McVay can still coach offense. Uh, that turned out to be true. We believe the defense can be okay, and and their defense was was decent despite parting with Wade Phillips. Um, the other game with some massive line movement towards the end was Seattle at Atlanta. You know, Seattle was a favorite for most of the week, and then that game moved to Atlanta as a one point favorite um, when it closed. So I disagreed with that line movement as well. Um, you know that that kind of bore itself out in in the result. Although I think that that, that game was much closer than. Um, the the score indicated. Well, we were talking about this before the show, but I was trying to figure out why that one moved. The Dallas one, I kind of understand because the depth <laughs> along the offensive line became more apparent. Like, Lyle Collins placed an injured reserve a while, or a while ago, so I didn't know why. Uh, but, like, once the inactives came out, I think it came be, became more apparent that the Cowboys' depth was bad along the offensive line. But I was trying to figure out reasons why the number shifted for the Atlanta-Seattle game. I could not figure them out. Like, I, I don't know. Uh, that one confuddled me. Yeah. Well, I mean, unless you believe in Atlanta and Matt Ryan. and I mean, I like Matt Ryan, but uh, it's Russell Wilson. <laughs> like, I think my, my worst my worst sweats from like a I don't want to look stupid always come when I go against Russell Wilson. So right. it happened again on Sunday, obviously, because I was rooting for them to not score points. Like, I wasn't rooting against Seattle specifically. I was rooting against sure. points. And Russell Wilson gave me the double barrel middle fingers, uh, but well, like Carol did, yeah, yeah, by and Brian <laughs> Schottenheimer, yeah, by actually using their good quarterback. But it was very strange because I guess, like again, I said when we were at beginning the segment, like I find Atlanta to be aggressively mediocre. So seeing that movement towards them against Seattle is confusing. Seeing them be pumped up in this Dallas game is confusing, but. No idea. I guess we'll see. Maybe the Falcons will win this game by six and we'll look very stupid on Monday. Let's dive into covering the future where we hopefully will not look stupid. And let's start things off here with that interesting New England at Seattle game. Ed, uh, we have some new data on both teams now. What are you seeing with this one as we get into to week number two? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think this is a pretty interesting game. I mentioned that the Seattle-Atlanta game was was much closer than, than it kind of seemed. It was 14-12. Uh, in the beginning of the second half, uh, Seattle went for it on a fourth and five. And instead of going short to pick up the first down, they threw a touchdown. 
Um, on the next play, uh, Atlanta faked a punt and looked like they had a first down, but then fumbled it away. And that was essentially the game. Um, you know, Atlanta put up a lot of yards uh, after that. But um, so, so a lot of their yardage was, you know, when the game was kind of out of hand later. But they did have 506 yards compared to 383 uh, for Seattle. You know, both teams were very efficient throwing the ball through the air. Um, almost eight yards per pass attempt for both teams. And I still have my questions about Seattle's defense. Uh, I know they picked up Jamal Adams. Um, but this was a unit that was like, you know, bottom 10 last year in terms of success rate adjusted for for who they played. Uh, and then uh, on the other side, New England. Let's talk about New England. So, you know, they started Cam Newton. Uh, they ran him a lot, 15 carries. A lot of talk about their touchdown. But he actually did all right throwing the ball as well, 6.7 yards per pass attempt. <clears throat> So, uh, you know, I don't think he's getting back to his 2015 efficiency levels in terms of throwing the ball. Um, but I do like what I see uh, out of New England. I think when you look at a game with Bill Belichick against Pete Carroll, uh, I, I like I, I like the idea of taking Bill Belichick. I think four points is too much. Uh, my model says this game should be uh, Seattle by <clears throat> 2.3 points. And uh, so, <coughs> so, yeah, I will take New England plus four. I I. This, I, I see this game coming back to three and a half, three points by the time we we kick off on Sunday night. Oh, and 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 it's going to be a little harder for Russ to cook, even if he's allowed to do that against the New England defense. That are you is, saying New England's defense is better than Atlanta's? Uh, I, shocker! I'm saying New England, Breaking news here on covering the spread. <laughs> I'm saying New England's defense is better than Atlanta's. Yes. Yeah, I think that's going to be a really fun game, um, not just because of the Seattle offense versus the New England defense, but like. I want to see Cam Newton in situations where he's put up, pressed up against the wall because, like, we saw last week, obviously, they were in control of that entire game, which meant that New England was able to use this, this rush-heavy approach, including Cam, in, in that equation. But if they have to throw, I want to see what Cam will do then. I'm not saying that I'm that skeptical of Cam. I just want to, ha- I want to know. Like, I, don't, I have no idea if he'll be able to throw the ball super efficiently because I did it, like, I think 21 times in week number one. So yeah. I want to see increased passing volume out of Cam Newton, not because of him. I want to see it because their wide receivers scare the poo out of me, and I think they might suck. So I want to see they what could. Cam does when he's forced to throw, and we're going to get answers on that, I hope. Like, I hope Seattle yeah. gets a lead in this game so we can get answers just because I want more of a sample than – 21 non-pressure dropbacks effectively but it's going to be so much more interesting if new england's up and russ has to go against that excellent that would secondary. be pretty fun that would be pretty <laughs> fun i i would enjoy that so uh back and forth how about that yeah for sure yeah and, and we'll see with cam i mean you mentioned the 21 pass attempts uh two sacks and only four incompletions there yeah so I, I think New England will take that can he do it when he's coming down and he needs to start picking up more chunk yards or uh, doubles, as uh, Dr. Eric Eager uh, mentioned on my podcast yesterday. I think that remains to be seen. You know, I mean, yeah. I think we know Edelman and, and James White are going to be good, but who else is going to step up at receiver for the Patriots? And chunk yardage is going to be the, the big issue. And I think that would be an issue if they fall behind. But if they can play from ahead, they will be in a good spot uh, because Sony Michelle right. actually was very successful as a rusher on Sunday, which is not something I expected. I think he had uh, eight of his 10 carries were uh, successful carries. So hmm. we'll see how that goes. But I think playing from ahead, New England is a very different team, and we'll see if they can get ahead of Seattle on Sunday night football. I want to talk about that Eagles-Rams game because we can often overreact what we saw in week number one. That's especially true when the context is different than what it will be going forward. So I want to get the over on Rams versus Eagles. It is currently 47 at FanDuel Sportsbook. However, I'm just saying, you can find a better number out there. I'd recommend you do so. But even the best you can get at your available books is 47. I would still take it. The reason I think we're both, that I think this is, I think that we're both overrating the Rams defense and underrating Philadelphia's offense. Philly had to play week one without Lane Johnson who is one of the best offensive tackles in football against arguably the league's best defensive line 
with Washington. With what they've assembled this offseason, they're going to be a force, and facing that without Lane Johnson is not great. Johnson, he said yesterday that he will play Sunday. We can't always take players at their word, uh, but Doug Peterson said that Johnson will practice today on Wednesday. He was close to playing week one. I'm betting he will be out there, and that's a massive upgrade for Philadelphia's offense. The Rams in week one allowed just 17 points to an awesome Dallas offense, but they were also down offensive linemen. They lost one during the game. And the Rams had a defensive exodus in the offseason. My prior going into the year was that they were going to struggle, and I'm not ready to jump off that based on that one game where Dallas had in-game injuries. But even if the Rams are good defensively, which could happen, this game gets a boost via the pace because after week one, the Rams rank ninth in situation neutral pace, according to Football Outsiders. The Eagles are 13th. Last year, they were third and 17th, respectively. So the play volume here should be good. And that's another route to an over, even if the defense does play pretty well. I think both these teams will be able to move the football, and it should be a heavy volume kind of game. That's enough for me to like the over here. So again, Make sure you shop around to get the best number there. Go to oddsfire.com for a dashboard to see what the best number is. But even if the best number you can get is 47, I do still like the over there. Ed, uh, any takeaways or any takeaways or thoughts for you on this week two game between the Rams and the Eagles? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I like that Carson Wentz threw two picks this past week. Which, you know, um, I, what was I, the other one? It was not just Carson Wentz. There's another one that you oh, the, the Tom Brady one. And Edward talked about this too. You were talking about Bruce Arians' offenses. Mm-hmm. Always tend to throw a lot of picks. What well, did Tom Brady do in his first game in a Bruce Arians' offense? I, I don't know if that's on Arians though, right? Like if you look at the two interceptions that Brady threw, like well, one of them not, was like... It's not a negative on Arians. It's saying that Bruce Arians runs aggressive offenses and aggressive right. offenses throw more picks. So it's not a negative that he throws picks. He just, they throw more picks in his offense. Yeah, 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 for sure. So, I mean, I think the I think the jury's still a little bit out on Brady, right? Like, I mean, yeah. I, you know, I went back this morning and looked at his bad ball rate, which is, you know, picks plus uh, passes defended per pass attempt. Mm-hmm. And, and Brady's been pretty good. Certainly he hasn't been good his last three games out. Um, but so, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, he's in a new system. We'll see how that goes in the future. But Wentz, I mean, two really, really poor interceptions. And then you know, I think I mentioned on this show his his bad sack fumble rate too. Yeah, uh, he, he fumbled twice, little... I think. What? Did he fumble twice? He fumbled twice. Game? He only lost one, but that was obviously a critical one when they were trying to come back. And and that's you know when you score 17 points in whatever the first part of the game and are up 17 nothing, <laughs> and then don't score again. Uh, th- there's probably great. some turnovers in there, and and we definitely saw that with Wentz. So. <laughs> You know, I, I'm looking to go against Philadelphia uh, online here. Uh, my, you know, my numbers actually don't say this is this is a game in which to do that. Yeah. Um, I definitely have my concerns about Dallas's uh, defense as well. So, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I guess what I think about this game is I'm glad Carson Wentz uh, did what he did in game one. I, I will stick with the you being right on the, the Bruce Arians offense. Not saying that Tom Brady can't do well. I'm more saying that like Bruce Arians offense is prone to interceptions. Interceptions are not always the worst thing. Uh, if it, if the right. result of downfield throwing, which they often are, uh, sure. but I think you can uh, pat yourself on the back a little bit there uh, for the Carson Wentz. I, and I, I'm, I'm going to, yeah, I, well, I'll definitely, I, I like the way the Wentz thing is going. I think the jury yeah. is still out on Tom Brady and Bruce Arians offense. I like, I right. think, I feel like we need at least half a season to see what's going on with that. So that's all we got for week two, but uh, this is the perfect transition, Ed. Where can people get the pick report? Yeah, so so members uh, have access to that. So you can go to my site, and uh, thepowerrank.net is actually a URL that will take you to a place where you can learn more about, about a membership. And then uh, all, the, all that bad ball data is actually in a nice uh, table uh, in the member section of my site. Uh, if you're not quite ready to uh, engage in a membership with my site, then you can also get the pick report separately, thepowerrank.info is a URL that will take you to a place where you can check that out. And there's many tiers. You can just get the report or the report plus the audio book or the entire package, which has the data on quarterbacks, which is, you know, kind of what you need if, if, yeah. if you want to start finding value with this stuff. But uh, there's also options for just the content version. And you said you had Dr. Eric Eager on your podcast this week too? Yeah, that might not be up when this podcast goes up, okay. but it will certainly be up uh, by Thursday morning at the very latest. Um, so yeah, yeah, we had a we had a pretty fun conversation. Uh, he does not 
think highly of the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> <laughs> Which was like, and I, and I, you know, I definitely believe him when when he says that he thought this before the season started. But not he tweeted about Vikings. it because he was talking about their youth uh, before the season. I believe that's the case. So yeah, I think that I think that was true. Yes. Yeah, their youth and just like I mean, that defense is not the same unit as when they signed Kirk Cousins a couple. Well, of years. also like Daniel Hunter is on injured reserve right now too. Like that's that's a right. huge impact. Yeah. Yeah, and you got rid of all your cornerbacks and have a bunch of young guys in there. Yeah. So, again, one of these games, is, is Aaron Rodgers going to have a breakout season compared to his last four seasons? Or does Minnesota just suck? I, right. I, again, something we won't know. Um, so, yeah, I think just like so many interesting storylines heading into week two. I mean, yeah. it starts Thursday night with, you know, what, what we're going to see with Cleveland. Hey. Big question marks with Cleveland. Um, and then Baltimore. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, there was a lot of things. I actually tweaked my model a little bit uh, this year to incorporate some of the early season market data in my models. But but Baltimore didn't need that. And and I like I try to set this up. So after one week, uh, the model doesn't overreact to anything. Yeah. But Baltimore's performance was so severe that they actually went up almost two points. Wow. And that's a lot. I mean, that's almost yeah. too much when I even say it out loud. So I'm going to try to ignore that that I said it out loud, but <laughs> I mean um, they're good, man. I don't they, I don't blame the model. They well they are good, and I was just looking like their pass offense was like eighth in adjusted success rate passing last year, and, and that, that was, was with Mark Andrews and Hollywood Brown playing limited snaps the entire year. Right. So yeah, they could they, go nuts. Yeah, and, and a defense that you know the front seven I had my doubts about them, but this a secondary that that is pretty good. Yeah. Um, which is the way I think you really want to build a modern uh, NFL defense, according to a lot of the work that PFF has done. Yep. And as a Baker backer, I am hoping Cleveland shows life. Just life. I don't need, I don't need a lot. I'm just asking for life. Um, It'll get easier against Cincy. So. Let's hope. Let us pray. Uh, make sure you check out uh, the Football Analytics Show. Subscribe to that so you can get it right when that podcast with Dr. Eric Eager is posted. And uh, check out the PowerRank.com and the PowerRank.info to get the pick report. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. You can follow Ed at the Power Rank. Big, big thank you to Edward Egros, our guest for today, for breaking down week two of the NFL. Find Edward on Twitter at Ed with Sports. Also, a thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer from the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Week one in the books, week two coming around the corner. Good luck to you, whether you're betting on college football, the NFL, or whatever else it may be, the Bristol night race on Saturday, the U.S. Open, whatever it may be, good luck to you. We'll talk to you again soon. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.